have been faithful. All my life you have been so, so good. With every breath that I have When we think about the goodness of God, and Denise, as you were praying there, talking about home, I don't know if that family is a family of faith. Yeah. They are, praise God, uh, because there's something about the goodness of God wants us to get to a place where we are at home. God wants us to feel like we're at home, and, and ultimately that is being at home in Him, and knowing that because we walk with Him, and because we know Him, and because He is with us every step of the way. We are always at home in Him. But there is something about, about being planted in the place that you feel God wants you to be. And there's an extra level of, of, of feeling at home for sure in that. So that really, that really ministered to me, just having lived abroad and having enjoyed living abroad, but knowing that it wasn't home. And, there's something, and God was with us and we felt at home in Him where we were, but we weren't at home. Uh, in that sense, so let's be praying, as Denise said, that there will be many families and many individuals like that at this time. And ultimately, we have people in Oban who are at home in Oban, but not at home in their walk with the Lord, in the sense of knowing the Lord and living for the Lord. So there's, there's another dynamic to that to praying as well, that God wants us to be at home in Him and be at home where he needs us to be. So, praise God. Well, I, I'm really excited this morning about opening God's Word and, and looking at this. I love getting to points in the Bible where I see people who really inspire me. We've, we've journeyed a lot, of course, through the Bible so far, and we've seen the good, the bad, and the ugly. And I'm not going to name names because, because I know where I would be if I was in this book, I would be part of the, the bad and the ugly at points in my journey uh, through my life. There have been some good as well, but, but we've seen the good, the bad, and the ugly in people. This morning and next week, we are digging into somebody who is an inspiration. This is the real... We're going to see the good, the bad, and the ugly of, of life and of the world, but we're going to see the good of what God can do through someone's life. When we think about this new year, and I think we're there every single new year, we think about the things that we want to do, so that is the aspirational, we think about the things that we no longer want to do, the things that we want to leave behind in the old year. But there's also things that irrespective of a new year, there are just things that we would never dream of doing. We would never dream of doing certain things. Is there something that you would never dream of doing? And if you feel brave enough to shout it out, there are of course many things that we would never dream of doing, there's no point in shouting out, but is there anything you would never dream of doing? You don't have to shout it out, but perhaps there are things that you can think of. Skydiving. And a hearty amen from me. I'm nervous enough being in the plane, let alone having to jump out of it. Um, I watched a video, uh, it was one of these kind of shorts that just pops up on your feet. And it was, um, it was a video of uh, a guy and a girl and they were standing side by side. And it was obviously the girl's first time doing the jump. This is not here, this is just from there. And, um, and it was 
the, the guy in the plane said, are you ready? And the girl was like, no. And they were like, tough, and off they went. You know? And it's like, that's why, that's one reason why I don't want to do that. Good. There are things that we would never dream of doing. How do we get to that? How have we got to that point where there's a red line, we think, well, I would never cross that line, I would never do that. How do we get to that personally, and how do we establish that generationally? Because I would propose that with every passing year, that line is changing. That line is creeping further and further away from the things that it once sat at. How do we get to that point personally? Perhaps because there's a conviction in us, a deeply rooted conviction, that no matter what, we will not go there, we will not do that certain thing. How do we understand how to get there personally and generationally? Well, I think that looking at at inspirational people can help. But also thinking perhaps about where maybe we or culture has crossed that line and started to do things that we would never dreamed of doing. Why have people, why have I perhaps at times fallen short and compromised? What causes us to do that? And then if we bring it into the realm of faith and the realm of walking with God and we think, well, what is it that stops us from acting? What is it that stops us from from holding true to God in certain moments? When we see that God's word says something but yet we cross that line and we, and we fall into that place of that, that area that we said we would never go. We find ourselves there. What, what are the reasons for that? Well, I think with the gospel, I want us to look at that this morning. And it's going to be the main thrust of the inspiration that we see in the individual. Is that for, for, for us, perhaps, there can be a fear of confrontation. A fear of, of actually, well, I'm going to compromise here. Uh, I'm going to let go of my conviction because actually I don't want to, to be in a place of confrontation. I wonder if, as a church, this is not the scripture for the year. Our scripture for the year is Lamentations 5. Last week's word is up on YouTube and on uh, Spotify, etc., etc. Um, in Lamentations 5, verse 19, that was the verse for the year. But this is a verse for every year. In fact, the whole word is a verse for every year. But uh, 1 Peter 3, verses 13 to 17. If you've got a Bible, turn to that. I think we've got that up. There we go. So, 1 Peter 3, verse 13 through to 17. The Word of God says, Who will harm you if you are devoted to what is good? But even if you should suffer for righteousness, you are blessed. Do not fear them, that is, those who would come against you, or be intimidated. Everyone ever ever felt intimidated when you've been in a place where you have to hold to your faith? And and you know that holding to your faith is going to cost you something in that moment? And there's that sense of confrontation. I don't want confrontation. Perhaps you feel intimidated. Do not fear them or be intimidated, but in your hearts... Regard Christ as Lord, Christ the Lord, as holy. Ready at any time to give a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you. Yet do this with gentleness and respect or reverence, keeping a clear conscience so that when you are accused, not if, but to journey through life as a believer, when you are accused, Those who disparage your good conduct in Christ will be put to shame. For it is better to suffer for doing good if that should be God's will than for doing evil. I think as a contemporary culture, and certainly my generation, we are so comfortable. We've not been through any real struggle. Maybe even my parents' generation were the same. My grandparents still went through um, World War II and, uh, and the end of World War I, uh, potentially as well. And so they understand that real sense of, of, of struggle and, and challenge in life. And so there's something about that that can, can really prepare people for life. It's better to suffer. I think we as a contemporary generation, 
are doing everything we can to avoid any level of suffering. And so we will build our lives in such a way that we never suffer, we never struggle. And that is the goal of every single lofty aim of the world, is to relieve suffering. And that is a good thing, absolutely. But there's something about going through hard times that is inevitable in the world. It's inevitable in life because of the brokenness, the fallen nature of the world. But we don't go through it alone. And God can see us through it and strengthen us through it in the process when things happen. But it's better to suffer for doing good. What is the context here? Holding to Christ no matter the circumstance. Better to suffer for doing good if that should be God's will than for doing evil. If we, as God's people, and I say this not just we as in OBC, but we as in the churches in Oban, the churches in Scotland and beyond, if we could lovingly hold to our convictions in Christ, no matter what, and fold it around us. What if we could get so good at that? So good at 1 Peter 3. That we always have the courage to give an account of the hope that's in us, but with gentleness and respect. So that when any tension arises, it doesn't arise because of how we have shared our hope, but because of their response to our hope. What if we could get so good at that? Imagine what the church would look like. The big C church, not just us, but the big C church. Imagine what our community would look like, maybe even our nation, if we could say to God, God, grow me in this. Mature me in this. Amazing. We're going to look at a man this morning called Daniel. And Daniel is going to teach us a lot. Daniel is going to teach us exactly how to live as a Christian in Scotland in 2023. You think, come on, Stuart, that's ridiculous. This is two and a half thousand, roughly, years ago. How can he possibly speak to my day? How can he speak to my culture and my context? How can he? Because nothing is new under the sun. And because God's truth never changes. God's way and calling never changes. So Daniel, two and a half thousand years ago, can speak to our reality right now. We're going to let him speak. Um, Tim Mackey, Bible Project, Tim Mackey, if you've ever heard him speak, uh, a lot of stuff on YouTube. He, he was talking about Daniel, was watching this, and it was brilliant. He said that for us as Christians and as believers in the, the only true God, we've always been part of a minority counter-cultural movement. So irrespective of what season in history, we've always been part of a minority counter-cultural movement. There have been times where there's been a large number that we're talking about, not just people who, when they get a form, say, well, I was born in Britain, therefore I'm a Christian, but actually, I love the Lord, therefore I'm a Christian. We've always been part of a minority counter-cultural movement. And what does that look like in, in an analogy? It looks like Tim Mackey says, jumping into a river that is flowing a certain direction and having to swim against the current. And that's where we are every single day. When you step out of your house and go to work, when you maybe go and get in amongst your family, when you go uh, out uh, and you're in amongst the world, we're in a river that is flowing a certain direction and God is asking us often to swim against the current. And it takes a lot of great effort to persist. Who's ever been, one of the things about our holiday is there's river rapids. Who's ever been in a, in a controlled, uh, safe, pre-produced river rapid? Great fun. Here's the thing though, Bethany is now at a point where she shall have armbands, probably not, I think she'll be free of that, she might have one of those kind of wee vests that's got, you know, plumage, uh, that helps her to float. Um, Beth can't go on that on her own because she's not old enough, mature enough or strong enough. What would happen if she goes in there by herself? Disaster would strike because she's not old enough. Uh, big enough or strong enough to cope with the, the pull of the current. And if we go in there and we try and swim against the current, it takes a lot of effort. You need to be big enough, uh, old enough, big enough and strong enough to swim against the current. 
Tamaki. I love that picture from Tamaki. But he also says that to, to go with the flow of culture takes no effort whatsoever. It takes no effort. To just be swept up by the current of the culture, the current of the current culture, takes no effort at all. You will face no confrontation, no uh, intimidation, as First Peter says. Nobody will come against what you think if you just get swept up by the current culture. But he does encourage us to swim against it when God, when appropriate and according to God's word. There's little honour afforded to God when we give in to the current of the current culture. So let's let Daniel speak to us this morning. Daniel chapter 1. Our Bibles are through the back. Sorry folks, if you haven't got a Bible this morning, it'll be up on the wall. We need to get the Bibles out. But in fact, next Sunday, that was the other announcement. Next Sunday, we're back at the high school. And we don't take the Bibles there. Bring your own Bible next Sunday uh, to, to the high school for church. Chapter 1, verses 1 to 5. Let's read this and then we will look at what it says. In the third year of the reign of King Jehoiakim of Judah, King Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon came to Jerusalem and laid siege to it. So we're, we're in this moment of exile again. Daniel is a contemporary of Ezekiel. So where we read Ezekiel before Christmas, we're in that moment again. We're now looking at Daniel. The Lord handed King Jehoiakim of Judah over to him, that is King Nebuchadnezzar. Everyone say boo. Boo. Along with some of the vessels from the house of God. So they ransacked the temple, they took all of the treasures. Nebuchadnezzar carried them, not personally, I'm sure he had help, but the principle is that he took them under his authority, carried them to the land of Babylon, to the house of his God, and put the vessels in the treasury of his God. Was that an offence to God? Absolutely. But was that the will of God for that moment? Yes. God said it was going to happen. That's what happened. There's going to be lessons coming through the, even these vessels as we journey through Daniel. The king ordered uh, Ashpenaz, his chief eunuch, to bring some of the Israelites from the royal family and from the nobility, young men without any physical defect, good looking, suitable for instruction in all wisdom, knowledgeable, perceptive, and capable of serving in the king's palace. He was to teach them the Chaldean language and literature. The king assigned them daily provisions from the royal food and from the wine that he drank. They were to be trained for three years, and at the end of that time, they were to attend to the king. So here we have beginning of exile moment. King Nebuchadnezzar is like, the only way I can picture it is like he's like a peacock. He wants to show his feathers. He is the king of the world in that moment, in the natural sense. Because his dominion is ruling and reigning over the nations in a natural sense and, of course, supernatural with the, the gods behind the scenes that he follows. But he's like a peacock. He wanted to surround himself with the trophies of his victory. What were the trophies of his victory? It was people from all different parts of the regions that he conquered. And he wanted to build and shape culture that reflected his convictions. Do you know, when we get a new leader in our country, a new prime minister, or in other countries, a new president, that's exactly what happens. They step in and they want to build a culture based upon their own convictions. And I think that's happening increasingly. Less and less is it about, what does Trisha think? What does Smitty think? What does George think? What does Jenny think? Because I'm here to represent them. I think it's increasingly more about, I'm going to build and shape a culture based on my own convictions. Nothing new under the sun. King Nebuchadnezzar was just like that. And he, he had his trophies there. And we have four names that are mentioned. Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. Daniel means God is my judge. Hananiah means Yahweh is gracious. Mishael means who is what God is, as in who is like him. And then Azariah, Yahweh has helped. So their names declared God's goodness. They declared his character. What does your name say about you? Do you know what your name means? We've been here before. When you speak your name out, what does it say? In biblical times we know it was making declaration. 
to who God was. Let's, uh, let's keep going. Verse 8, chapter 1, verse 8. Daniel determined that he would not defile himself with the king's food or with the wine he drank. So he asked permission from the chief eunuch not to defile himself. And here we're introduced to lesson number one from Daniel. The inspiration that we can draw from this incredible text. We know that many of his contemporaries, and again, if you want to know what was going on, go to Lamentations, look at Lamentations. In fact, look at the verses preceding our verse for the year and the verses following our verse for the year to see the struggle that was happening in and around Daniel's context. So Daniel is surrounded by that reality. His contemporaries are struggling. But Daniel was given this incredible offer. 1 verse 5, the king assigned them daily provisions from the royal food and from the wine that he drank, the choicest food, the choicest drink. He's offered a place of comfort where he's going to be trained in language and in culture. I think if we were to ask people, do a straw poll of our country and say, who wants to be given incredible food, incredible wine, an incredible education and an incredible level of comfort. People would say, bring it on. Yes, please. Have you ever compromised based on your conviction? Have you ever stepped over the red line that you had set? Daniel has a conviction. All he had to do, though, to enjoy all those things was compromise. Do you know, hardly anyone's going to know who is going to know? Let's be honest. Who is going to know if Daniel just said, do you know that? That steak looks tremendous. Steak and a glass of red wine? I'll take that. All he had to do was compromise. He had numerous excuses available to him. There's a moment of decision needs to be made here. What were the excuses? Well, we're going to see them in a minute. But if we look back on our own lives, do we remember moments in our journey where we made a choice? And looking back, we know it was the wrong choice and it changed everything from that moment forward. Everything changed because in that moment we chose to say something or do something that caused us to compromise. This is what I love about Daniel in this moment and it's inspirational for us to look at this. Maybe we felt squeezed and pressed in that moment and we made a decision that in hindsight we wouldn't normally make but we felt pressured. What's forgotten in those moments? Those moments where we do make that call to step across a line that we had previously drawn. What's forgotten in that moment is God's instruction so often. God's standard. Whether we've read it or whether it's written in our hearts by the Spirit and then look at 1 verse 9. Daniel determined he would not defile himself. He didn't want to take the king's food, partly because it would be the food that him, he as a Jew would not eat. And he knew that eating it would defile himself against the food laws that had been laid out for his people. So he doesn't want to do that. He asks permission. Verse 9. God granted Daniel kindness and compassion from the chief eunuch. What do we often forget in those moments where we feel pressed and stressed and perhaps we make the wrong call is that we forget Emmanuel. We forget that God is with us. And so for us to take a stand with gentleness and respect, politely, Daniel determined that he wouldn't, so he asked permission. He did it gently, he did it well. But he did, it, he did it knowing Emmanuel, knowing that God was with him. How do you know God is with him? Because God had granted Daniel kindness and compassion. God's at work beyond Daniel in this moment. Daniel makes a decision to honour God because it's always the right decision. Let's go to chapter 1, verses 11 to 14 and look at them together. So Daniel said to the guard whom the chief eunuch had assigned, to Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, Please test your servants for ten days. Let us be given vegetables to eat and water to drink. Let me pause there and say, 
and I have so much admiration for Daniel. <laughs> um, just going on to a purely vegetable diet. Uh, Bob Buckley, you know who I often go to, to, to uh, for my study time, he says that he thinks that it also included like pulses, it was just the things that were naturally grown. So no meat, but so he kind of extended it out to kind of pulses and, and uh, let me see, I think I made a note of it just to give myself some encouragement um, here. I wrote it down. Pulses and grains and veg. It wasn't just vegetables, it was more than that, probably, most likely. Daniel, so Daniel, please test your servants for 10 days. Let us be given vegetables, pulses and grains. I don't want to add to the word of God, you know, so let's just say vegetables. To eat and water to drink. Then examine our appearance and the appearance of the young men who are eating the king's food and deal with your servants based on what you see. The chief eunuch and the, the guard agreed to test them for 10 days. So they get tested for 10 days. Daniel understands his context. He doesn't go in all guns blazing to the moment and say, well, I can't eat that. I'm Jewish. I'm, I'm part of the people of God. I'm not going to eat that meat. This meat that the king has so graciously offered while my brothers and sisters beyond me are struggling and suffering and starving. He goes in with gentleness. He goes in with conviction, but he stands up gently. He stands firm gently. He trusts that God will ensure that the vegetables, and potentially the apostles and grains, are enough. He trusts that God is going to make a way because he is being faithful to God. Verses 15 and 16, at the end of the 10 days, they looked better and healthier than all the young men who were eating the king's food. Is there a lesson in there for Stuart? Yes, there's a lesson in there for Stuart, potentially. Um, one that I will learn this year. No, I just um, <clears throat> he understands the context. He stands up firm but gentle. God proves himself faithful. God always proves himself faithful. And he does so in response to Daniel's faithfulness. Daniel wants to hold true to God in, in, in his dietary requirements, so he, he's faithful to God. God is faithful all for what? And here's where I think for time's sake we will we'll end on this. There's more to say on this. We'll come to it next week. Why is this important? It's important for Daniel, yes. So when Daniel puts his head on a pillow at night, he says, even if I suffer for righteousness sake, he's done the right thing by God. He puts his head on a pillow knowing he's done the right thing. But here's what I think is bigger, and we're gonna see with the book of Daniel, which is much bigger. All for what reason? That Daniel can remain in the world, but not of it. God needs him there. If he'd said, if he'd gone in all guns blazing and said, there's absolutely no chance, he would have been removed from that context and he would no longer have been able to be the resource for God in that moment. That is the will of God for everyone, that we, are, we remain in the world, but we're not of it. And here's the next thing, that his people can penetrate all areas of society whilst never compromising who they should be. Isn't that huge? Daniel is in this moment standing firm, gently, respectfully, standing firm so that he can remain in the world but not be of the world and so that he can penetrate this level of society and be an influence for God. He can per uh, penetrate, permeate the culture around himself because he is holding to God. We'll come to this next week and we'll unpack it more uh, as we look at it. But this is an amazing book. Uh, if you've not yet, and I didn't print off because we didn't buy paper uh, for our printer, if you've not yet picked up uh, online our chronology for the, the final year, our third year, we're still in Ezekiel, I think, in the chronology reading, but we're going to get into Daniel. Let's journey it together. It's like one chapter a day. If you're doing something else, that's fine. But if you do feel you can join us, then journey with us, because it's amazing to think that we're all reading roughly the same thing at the same time, and God is speaking his truths. Here's something. God is speaking his truths to us 
through the same text every week. Now he does it on a Sunday morning, and that's great. But what if he was doing it with us through the week as well? If you opened your Bible and thought, when he's reading that, no pressure with uh, Sue, Liz, you've been doing it. You've been doing it, Liz. So, I won't pick on my But if I get up in the morning and think, do you know, I know that Liz and Sue are here this week as well. That excites me. So, an invitation. Join us. Join us on that journey um, so that we can let God speak to us. And then next week we'll come to the Oh, it gets so good. It does get so good. It really, this this book really has uh, moved me this week. Welcome back, guys. Um, let's pray and then we'll worship and then we'll have tea and coffee. Father, thank you for your word. Lord, it's a miracle that I got through what I got through. And I just thank you, God, that there is more. There's always more in you. So, Father, I pray give us an anticipation for, for more of Daniel's story in the coming days. But thank you, God, that your word speaks to us challenges us and changes us, not just what we should have done, but giving us inspiration as to what somebody else is doing. Father, be with us as we close off this time, and be with us, God, as well as we, as we share in fellowship afterwards. In Jesus' mighty name. Amen, amen.